and gentlemen, please welcome Pam Ayres. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello. How are you? Hello. Good. Well, it's very, very nice to be back here in my favourite theatre. And of course, it's not far for me to come uh, because um, I only just live down the road. I uh, live in Sirencester now, but I was actually brought up in the Vale of the White Horse in Berkshire. Um, although I'm always attributed to different places, I'm usually attributed to Devon or Cornwall or Somerset or Norfolk or Suffolk. <laughs> Oh, once famously in Australia, where I was introduced as the great Cockney poet, Pam Ayres. <laughs> but no, I'm from Stamford in the Vale, which used to be in Berkshire and which is now in Oxfordshire. And I had a very nice upbringing there. Um, I did with my four older brothers and my older sister, Jean. And my dad worked for the electricity board for 44 years and got a clock. <laughs> anyway. When I think back to my childhood, I mean, I don't want to try and sound like Laurie Lee, but I was lucky. I did have a very nice country childhood. Um, and we were able to do things according to the seasons of the year. And so our activities were immensely varied, although we didn't have any toys much, you know. Um, we used to do all sorts of different things. And in the summer, we used to swim in the River Ock, which runs through Stanford. And we didn't have any water wings or blow-up rings or inflatable <laughs> crocodiles or anything like that. So um, in an effort to keep ourselves afloat, we would pull up great bundles of rushes from the side of the river out of the silt and make them into a ball and put them under your front like this and then you'd go doggy paddling off down the river ock and the trick was to learn to swim before the rushes sank. <laughs> And then it was winter, and uh, the next exciting event would be bonfire night. And bonfire night was very thrilling indeed, because all the villages in the Vale of the White Horse used to vie with each other to try and build the biggest and most spectacular bonfire. And you would do what you could as a child. You'd throw on any rubbish, you'd pull out all bits of wood from the hedgerow and try and make it big and important looking. But it wasn't actually until the last few nights before bonfire night itself that you actually found out how big your bonfire was going to be because during the last few nights in the early hours of the morning <laughs> men would creep out of their row of houses carrying repulsive old stained mattresses <laughs> and whirl them up on top of the bonfire and this had to be done under cover of darkness because nobody wished to be identified <laughs> As the owner of the mattress, or the person so lacking in fastidiousness <laughs> that he might have slept on it. <laughs> because it was perfectly possible to look at one of these mattresses and to trace the entire course of somebody's life. <laughs> yeah. You could see where somebody had been born, somebody had died, and every human transaction in between, really. So. <laughs> Of all the things we did in Stanford, all the things that the kids did, and the lovely thing was we went to the village school, you know, so we all knew each other. I mean, you didn't necessarily like each other, but you all knew each other. Um, and, we, and, and of the varied activities that we did through the year, my favourite time was haymaking time, because it was lovely. It was the beginning of summer, you know, in June, and the farmer would cut the hay and put the piles of bales in tall towers in the field ready to be taken back to the farm. But before he had the opportunity to do that, a great horde of kids, including myself, would turn up in the field and rearrange the bales. <laughs> into much more interesting structures. And the boys used to make forts and castles and warlike sort of platforms from which they could throw missiles at one another. But we girls were very girly indeed, and we just used to make houses. And I used to sit in there for hours. I loved it. I used to sit in my little grass house because it was a great novelty. You know, there was eight of us in Aero, so it was a great novelty to have a room of your own. Um, 
even if it was only made out of eye, it was... Uh... <laughs> but you, you didn't usually have the chance to sit there very long because you would be evicted by older kids who had much more salacious intentions <laughs> for the bale house because they used to go in for a snog. And this caused a lot of excitement amongst all the other kids in the village uh, and in the field because most of the families in Stanford were related to one another. So, we, you know. <laughs> so you'd go round and somebody would say to you, here, Air Mary's in there with your Dennis having a snog, see? Um, this would cause a frisson of excitement and some wag would go and get a bucket of water out the brook would bring it back and tip it in through the cracks on top of the couple to cool their ardour. So you can see, can't you, that I had a very spicy, racy sort of upbringing in Stamford in the Vale. You can see that, can't you? Yeah, yeah, it was. And I think now it was a very good thing that something spicy was going on because at that time, in the 50s, in Stamford in the Vale, certainly as far as I was concerned, and I am convinced, as far as most of my friends were concerned, the teaching of the facts of life was very, very limited indeed. And in all honesty, the only instruction I ever had on the subject, to the best of my recollection, was my mother wagging her finger at me and saying, don't you go bringing any trouble back here. <laughs> and that was, that was it. That was all I got. And when I think about it now, half of me wants to laugh. Half of me wants to throw back my head and have a good laugh because it was very stupid, because nothing was ever discussed. It was all brushed under the carpet. Everybody was very coy on the subject. It was never talked about. But the other half of me wants to weep because what it meant was that you actually grew up in such pitiful ignorance. And you grew up never knowing what was what, really, and you, there was all this innuendo and jokes and nodding and winking and stuff, but nobody ever sat you down sensibly and gave you a nice little talking to and said, now, you are of an age when you ought to know for your own safety and well-being how things work between men and women. I mean, that would have been really nice, but you never got it. <laughs> the way it was done... was that you were presented with a series of indisputable facts. The first and most crucial of which was this one, that men were only after one thing. <laughs> you didn't know what it was, but... I... <laughs> But they were after it, all right. <laughs> and it was your solemn Christian duty to stop them <laughs> from getting it. <laughs> and this was by no means as straightforward as you might suppose, because my mum used to say these things to me all the time. They were sort of helpful hints, except I never understood them. And um, she used to say, ah, they'll say anything. They'll say anything they think you want to hear to get what they want. <laughs> My mother had a very high opinion of men, as a matter of fact. And, uh, <laughs> and you, didn't just, you didn't just get it from your own mum, you got it from everybody else's mum as well. If you went down the village, you know, you'd get all this helpful advice. Again, I know that the ladies were trying to protect us. And there was one real nice lady I got on very well with, much older than me, and she was not unusual in that she had 14 or 15 children. She had a vast family, and so did many women in the village. And I remember her saying to me one day, she said, ah, in this wistful little voice, she said, ah, don't you do what I did, Pammy. You get the ring on your finger first. <laughs> And, um, yeah, and another thing my mum used to say was this, and I never understood it. That was the thing. I never understood what they were getting at. My mum used to say, um, it's the woman who has to carry the can. <laughs> what can?
can. I don't know what you're talking about. I thought she meant the paraffin can. We have one of those. And, and my best friend at school, she said when the time came for her mother to broach the subject in her case, she said, I have never been so embarrassed in my entire life. She said, my mother must have been in another part of the house getting herself into a real stew because she felt she had to say something, anything on the subject. And she said, when my mother came in, she was all of a twitch. <laughs> And what my mother actually managed to splutter out, she said, was this. She said, um... <laughs> I suppose, by now, you know the meaning of the word connection. <laughs> my friend said, I thought she was talking about the trains. <laughs> Anyway, all that was when I was a girl, and um, I feel as though I wasn't much more than a girl when I wrote this first poem, which I'd like to do for you. Um, this is a piece which everybody tends to ask me for, um, so we'll start off with this one, and I wrote it one day when I had to go to the dentist, and I was very, very nervous, because I have got a very fertile imagination, and I could just imagine what it was going to be like when I got there, and I had one of those late appointments, you know, at six, six o'clock at night, and I had all day to get in a lather about it. And I could just imagine walking into the dentist's building and you're assailed by certain things, aren't you, that are always there. You can smell the disinfectant, the antiseptic, and you can hear far, far away in the marrow of somebody else's teeth <laughs> the drill. <laughs> and you know it's your turn coming up shortly. And I, and I could just imagine laying on that hard old dentist's bed and listening to him turn over all the tools in his toolbox. <laughs> looking for the right socket spanner. <laughs> Imagine seeing this great hypodermic coming at you. And so I just wrote this one day to make fun of something that I was afraid of. Oh, I wish I'd looked after me teeth and spotted the dangers beneath. All the toffees I chewed and the sweet, sticky food. Oh, I wish I'd looked after me teeth. I wish I'd been that much more willing when I had more tooth there than filling to give up gobstoppers from respect to me choppers and to buy something else with me shilling. When I think of the lollies I licked and the licorice all sorts I picked, the sherbet dabs, big and little, or that hard peanut brittle, oh, my conscience gets horribly pricked. See, my mother, she told me, no end. If you've got a tooth, you've got a friend. But I was young then and careless. My toothbrush was airless. <laughs> and I never had much time to spend. I showed him the toothpaste, all right. I flashed it about late at night. But up and down, brushing and poking and fussing, it didn't seem worth the time. I could bite. But if I'd known I was paving the way to cavities, caps, and decay, to the murder of fillings, injections, and drillings, I'd have thrown all my sherbet away. <laughs> so I lie in the old dentist's chair, and I gaze up his nose in despair. <laughs> and his drill, it do whine in these molars of mine. To amalgam, he'll say, for in there. And how I laughed at my mother's false teeth as they foamed in the waters beneath. <laughs> but now comes the reckoning. It's me. They are beckoning. <laughs> oh, I wish I'd looked after me too. <laughs> My husband and I have got two sons, Will, who is 23, and James, who is 21. And um, I had them very late, really, compared to many women. I was 35 when I had my first child and 37 when I had my second. So, you know, I was very lucky to squeeze them in before everything collapsed, really. Um, 
But I'm so glad, I'm so glad I had them uh, because I wasn't a particularly maternal person. You know, I wasn't always looking in babies' prams and picking up other people's babies. I wasn't like that. Uh, but if I hadn't have had them, I, I would have missed so very much. Um, anyway, when I had my first son, and we were in the hospital, and he was in his little cot with plastic over the top. My sister came to see me, and she already had children, you know, older children. And she looked at my baby, and I did feel pretty inept. I didn't have much idea about how to look after him. And my sister said something to me that scared me, although it, that was not her intention. She looked at the baby, and she said, um, <clears throat> you'd enough have to take him a long way, you know. And I thought, yeah. Look at him, he's just a little blob, you know, and you have to take them such a long way through all the years and all the dangers and pitfalls until they are an independent adult. And it seemed such a long, difficult journey for which I felt very ill-equipped. Anyway, what seemed like not long afterwards, I was standing watching him play rugby when he was 17. <laughs> and um, he was pounding up and down, they were playing rugby, pounding up and down, great clods of earth were being kicked up, and I was standing there, and I was perished with cold, and a bitter wind was coming across this rugby pitch, so that my eyes were full of tears, and I couldn't see properly. Anyway, they were playing, they were thundering about, and suddenly a boy was kicked. There was a sickening impact, a horrible bone-crunching sound, and the boy shrieked. It was a horrible uh, shriek of pain, and he was helped off with his foot all folded underneath him like this, and somebody was waiting with a sophisticated first aid remedy, a packet of frozen peas. <laughs> um, and so... Uh, there, there, there was uh, um, a hiatus as they waited to see if they could patch him up or whether he'd have to be taken off to hospital. And so the boys were just standing around waiting on, on the field. And there was a fellow not far from me, and I was looking at him. I was looking at him vacantly up and down through my blurred vision. And I registered that he had a big, thick neck and great big, broad shoulders, enormous, airy legs... I could see him standing out there steaming like a dry horse on that winter's day. <laughs> and I was just vacantly looking at him. I didn't register any more than that. Anyway, then to everybody's surprise, really, the boy who'd been kicked ran back on. He ran back on. Hooray! And they gave him a little smatter of applause for his courage. And this boy that I'd been looking at turned and ran off. And I realised for the first time that it was my own son <laughs> and I hadn't recognised him. <laughs> I, no, this is perfectly true. I hadn't recognised him because he looked so impossibly grown up. And he had one of those skull caps on, you know, like a cobweb um, <laughs> thing. And, they, uh, and he had a great big yellow mouth guard over his teeth like this. And big padded shoulders in his jumper. And it looked... It seemed impossible that that man of 17 could have had anything whatsoever to do with the little boy that I had taken to that school what seemed like such a short time before. A little tremulous, thin boy <laughs> with legs like sticks and a great conker of a kneecap sticking out <laughs> halfway up. No, it just seemed impossible that there could have been any connection between the two of them. He had suddenly exploded into being this great big man. And I had feelings come over me of impending redundancy, which I didn't like. <laughs> How can that be my baby? How can that be my son? Standing on a rugger pitch more than six feet one. The steam is rising from him. His legs are streaked with blood and he wears a yellow mouth guard in a face that's black with mud. How can that be my baby? How can he look like that? I used to sit him on my knee and read him Postman Pat. <laughs> and those little ears with cotton buds I kept in perfect shape. But now they're big and purple and they're fastened back with tape. <laughs> Can that be my baby? When did he reach that size? What happened to his wellies with the little froggy <laughs> eyes? 
his shirt is on one shoulder, but it's hanging off the other. And the little baffled person at his feet is me, his mother. <laughs> I don't feel nostalgic like that anymore because they're both still at home. <laughs> so... <laughs> yep. And do you, know, do you know how big they are? They are six feet five. Both of them are six feet five. And don't they eat? <laughs> oh, God, don't they eat? It is extraordinary how much food they eat. And they come in. I've got a, a, a fridge with double doors. You know, you open it like that. And they'll come in and they'll march up to the fridge and they'll wrench it open like this and put their arms along the top and they'll sway backwards and forwards like this, like a great vulture. <laughs> and they'll look, look into the depths of the fridge with an expression of exquisite disappointment because there's never anything in there. Because <laughs> I go out and do a big shop and they come home and do a big eat, so, you know. <laughs> It's all over, and I'm afraid I have started dropping ints. I've started dropping ints, I'm afraid. I said on Saturday to our eldest son, Will, I said, well, 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 I think it's about time you took a wife. He said, well, whose wife do you want me to take? <laughs> so... I don't feel like I'm making a lot of headway, really. <coughs> anyway, talking about wives, uh, this is a poem of mine which is used a lot these days at weddings, it seems. And uh, it's from the point of view of the bride, and I actually think she's, she's quite a nasty piece of work. <laughs> yes, I'll marry you, my dear, and here's the reason why. So I can push you out of bed when the baby starts to cry. And if we hear a knocking... and it's creepy, and it's late, well, I hand you the torch, you see, and you investigate. <laughs> yes, I'll marry you, my dear, you may not apprehend it, but when the tumble dryer goes, it's you that has to mend it. <laughs> you have to face the neighbour should our Labrador attack him, and if a drunkard fondles me, it's you that has to whack him. <laughs> Yes, I'll marry you, my dear, you're virile and you're lean. My house is like a pigsty. You can help to keep it clean. <laughs> and that little sexy dinner which you served by candlelight, as I just do chipolatas, <laughs> you can do it every night. <laughs> it's you that has to work the drill and put up curtain track. And when I've got the PMT, it's you who gets the flack. <laughs> I do see great advantages, but none of them for you. And so, before you see the light, I do. I do, I do. <laughs> we got a new dog. No, we have. We got a new dog. And uh, it's nice to have a new dog, but... As is often the case, we got a new dog because our old dog died. Uh, yeah, it was really sad, actually, because we'd had her for 12 years. And she was a darling old dog. We got her from the dog's home. And um, she was what they optimistically described as a Labrador type. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, she was my children's companion all the time they were growing up. There was always the three of them, the two little old boys and the dog dancing around them. And when she died, it was a real poignant loss. Uh, she'd got very old and frail. And we came down one morning and she had died um, in the kitchen. And I keep a towel for each of my dogs, which I dry them on if they come in wet. And she had a big blue towel, so we just wrapped her up in her towel. And my son's dug a grave under some apple trees in the garden and we buried her and everybody cried. We just all cried. And that night, I had 500 people in a theatre in Essex waiting for a good laugh. It was just... <laughs> it was the most dismal bit of timing, you know, because you couldn't, you couldn't cancel. You can't, you can't say, I can't go because my dog's died. But, 
you know, people are distraught, aren't they, when they, you lose your dog. It's, it's a terrible feeling. And I feel so sorry for that audience because I looked a real tear-stained old wreck. And I couldn't say to them, you know, I'm sorry, I look a bit like off because my dog's died, because they didn't want to know that. And anyway, if I'd have said that, I'd have burst into tears, so it was really tricky. Anyway, you just do the best you can. We'd lost our dog. And after a time, we began to realise that um, we'd accepted it. We got a little dog, a Jack Russell, called Tatty. And uh, she's called Tatty because every hair that grows out of her grows at a different angle. <laughs> <laughs> My husband says she looks like a lavatory brush. Um, <laughs> and she was lonely because she didn't have anybody to stand underneath. And we got a lot of space, and we didn't have a dog. You know, we felt we had room for another dog, and the dog's homes are full of good dogs waiting for a good home. So I thought, I'll just go down to Burford and have a look at the Blue Cross home there and have a walk around, see if they've got anything that would suit us. So I did. I went down there, and I walked all around the cages. And some dogs looked as if they'd rip your limb from limb. But, um, you know, I came to this other lovely dog, a beautiful dog, a golden retriever called Hattie. And she had lovely blonde long ears, you know, and these beautiful kind eyes. She was a cracking dog. So I rushed into the office and I said, oh, I like the look of that dog, that golden retriever. And he said, well, I'm sorry, dear, but she's spoken for it. And she'd been there for yonks. But her family had just come the day before I got there and they had spoken for her. So that was that. Was that. So I went back outside and um, looked round again. And I was walking around the cages and I came to this other dog. And I stopped in my tracks, really, because it was a very strange-looking dog. It was very, very tall, thin, agonisingly thin, spindly dog. And all the nobbles of its backbone were all sticking out down its vertebrae. And it was a real thin, sad-looking dog with long black ears and a black saddle and sort of spots on it. It was a strange looking critter. And um, all around its cage, it had a blue and white cordon like the police put around a crime scene. <laughs> on which somebody had written in black felt tip pen, do not approach this dog. This dog is suspected of having ringworm. And so other people were drawing away, you know, they were repelled. But I wasn't too bothered about that because having cattle, you know sometimes they get ringworm and it's not that difficult to treat. So anyway, I looked at this dog and this dog looked at me and the run had been freshly disinfected and the dog was standing in a shallow puddle of disinfectant and it was just drooping. It looked the most hopeless dog, desolate, lonely, with no hope of ever being happy again. And I thought, well, that dog looks daft enough to be air dog, really, so... So anyway, I went into the man again and I said, um, I like the look of another dog. I said, I like the look of that mongrel out there, what, what might have ringworm. <laughs> and he said, oh no, dear. Oh no, dear. He said, that is not a mongrel. That, dear, is a large Munsterlander. <laughs> I'm not making this up. Has anybody ever heard of it? <laughs> See, some people have heard of a large Munsterlander. Well, it's a German gun dog. It's a rough shooting dog, and it was developed in and around the city of Munster in Germany. Anyway, I said I liked the look of her, and I said, what's her name? He said, her name is Ella. I said, oh, I don't like that name much for a dog. You know, it's a bit sort of wishy-washy. Uh, could I call her something else? He said, oh, yes, dear, of course, you can call her anything you like, but she won't know who you're talking to. <laughs> So uh, that's, that made sense. So I said that we, we'd like to offer her a home. And what you can't do, if you go to one of these dogs' homes, you can't just clip a lead on the dog and take it home. They don't let you do that. They, won't dream, they wouldn't dream of it because the dogs have had a bad start in many cases and they want to make sure that you are a good home or have got you know, a good chance of being one. So what they ask you to do is go through various procedures. The first of which is they like to see any dogs that you've got at home. <laughs> So I went and got Tatty, <laughs> and Tatty came in saying, the bigger they come, the harder they fall. <laughs> <Like this. laughs> anyway, when she saw the stupendous size of the other dog, <laughs> she, she literally decided to play ball, and they, um, they ran after a ball, and they were fine, and they didn't fall out. So that was all right. And then the dog's home liked to see all the members of the family who live at home. 
I'm not making it up, they do. And uh, you have to come in, and you all line up, and they look in your ears. <laughs> to see if you've got canker. <laughs> no, I made that up. But they do like to... They do like to see all the people who live at home, I suppose, to tell if there are any dissenters. And then <clears throat> they come to your house, and they look at your garden to make sure the dog can't get out, make sure it's all secure, and then they make a decision. And they did, and they did all this with us, and then they decided that we could have the dog. And we went and got her, and we brought this great, sad, spindly dog home. And she was 10 months old, and she had had no training of any kind at all. And when I got her home, <laughs> My, my excitement tend to started to diminish because I, I realised what... Well, I started to realise just what I had taken on because the dog had had no training. It did take a blind bit of notice of anything you said to it. It totally ignored you. It wasn't clean. or well, you don't want to know about that, but it wasn't clean. And it stole food. It made no distinction between what was put down on the floor for her and what was put up on the worktop for us. <laughs> You know, so if you left a delicious roast leg of lamb up on the top, she would say, well, that's dashed good of you, I'll help myself. <laughs> and um, I made this cake one day. I don't actually make a lot of cakes, but I had a lot of people come in for tea, and I made this beautiful cake. It was a Victoria sandwich, and I doubled the recipe so it'd be a big one, and it had lovely fluted edges, and it was a marvellous golden brown, and I sandwiched it with a thick layer of double cream, and then a thick layer of homemade black currant jam, so this voluptuous red jam sort of dribbled down the sides, and I put the lid on, and I even dredged it with icing sugar over the top. And that cake looked like a picture in a magazine. It was like a work of art, and I put it on a posh plate, and I left it on the worktop. <laughs> and I went up to get the wash in. When I came down, when I came down, I walked into the kitchen, I honestly thought I was seeing things. Because <laughs> it was a scene of utter desecration. <laughs> and this beautiful cake had just been wrecked, and the whole top had been slid down onto the floor. It was all mashed up. There was cream, jam, great skidding, poor prints. <laughs> and the top was all broken. The rest of it was off its lovely little plate. It was a real mess of jam and great unks of cake. And there's this great dog, and its whiskers are all covered in cream. <laughs> great fat pieces of cake all around its nose. And it's saying, it's nothing to do with me. <laughs> I don't eat cake. <laughs> and there's, there's, there's Tatty down on the floor saying, get some more down, get some more down, quick. And so... So I thought, I'd better get some help. I thought, this dog's beyond me. I'll have to get some help. So I rang the vet and I said, please, can you recommend a good dog trainer? Because I've taken on rather more than I thought I had here. And so the vet said, well, this lady is very highly spoken of. People think a lot of this lady. Uh, so I rang her up and uh, she looked in her diary and she said, yes, she could come and train me. <laughs> And um, we made an appointment, and she arrived in a great big truck. And when she got out, I was a bit taken aback, really, because she was quite a big, formidable sort of woman. A big, stout woman, she was. And she walked in, and she said, Morning, Mrs. Russell. So that's my married name, you see. My, my husband's been called Mr. Ayres for 23 years. <laughs> <laughs> and it gets on his wick. <laughs> She said, morning, Mrs. Russell. Now, she looked at the dog. She said, now, the first thing I observe about your dog is that your dog does not come back when you call it. <laughs> well, I'd observed that for myself. <laughs> oh, she said, so today we will work on the recall. The recall. See? She said, I want you to attach your dog to a long rope. And I want you to sprint. But, <laughs> I want you to sprint across the field in the direction of the oak tree. Uh, I want you to call your dog's name enthusiastically, blow your whistle, and when you reach the tree, I want you to bob round behind it and proffer the titbit. <laughs> uh, 
I didn't know if I was on foot or horseback. <laughs> so anyway, off, off I go, so I'm running along, and this is a tremendous great dog, and it nearly pulled my arm off. And I'm trying to blow the whistle, call the dog's name, and the lady's back here shouting, she can't hear you. She can't hear you, speak up. So anyway, eventually I get around the back of the tree, eat the tit bit by mistake. And, <laughs> and, uh, and I have to say that was one of the most humiliating experiences of my whole life. And this went on for about three weeks and a lady came and showed me all the different techniques. And then I said I would try now to put it in practice on my own. So the first day I was left on my own with the dog, a really terrible, awful thing happened. Um, my husband took the dog out last thing at night for a wee. For the dog. <laughs> and... <laughs> and um... <laughs> Yeah, the time went on, and I thought, well, I don't know, he's been out there a long time, and I began to get misgivings. And he was out there for ages, and eventually, the back door's kicked open. In he comes, he's all red in the face. He's in a real state, he's blazing. He comes storming in, and he says, the bloody dog's run off. <laughs> <laughs> and then... <laughs> And you know what's coming next, don't you? You know what's coming next? He says, I never wanted the bloody dog in the first place. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, really? Well, you might have said so at the time. <laughs> anyway, the dog had gone. She had gone. You know, she's a gun dog. The poor dog had been shut up in London for the first year of its life. It was outside. We're surrounded by rabbits and foxes. And the dog had just put her nose down and gone. She'd vanished. We all rushed outside. And it was foggy and absolutely still and late at night. And there wasn't a sound. We didn't have a clue where she'd gone. And oh, I went indoors and I rang the police. And I rang the dog warden in Swindon. And we all went out looking for her. And my boys went off in their cars. My husband went off in his car. And I could see them in the distance. I could see these headlights crisscrossing the fields, you know, just searching for her. And I just walked along the roadside. We, we searched for her all night. And I gave up at half past four in the morning after I'd been walking along the side of the road, you know, looking in all the undergrowth with a big torch, shouting, Achtung! <laughs> a great frankfurter come on <laughs> anyway she uh, she didn't she didn't come home we, we never found her ourselves and she certainly didn't come home that night um but anyway l amazingly really as we'd had her for such a short time uh, she came home the next morning about 11 o'clock she just turned up and i don't know what she'd been doing i hope she hadn't been killing sheep she wasn't bloody or anything but anyway it was the last thing you want to happen in the country so that was a real low spot but since then she's um She's improved a lot, and we've really gathered momentum, and she's now a real good dog. And uh, the funny thing was, we've been taking her to the dog training class in, in Daglingworth Village Hall. And um, it's all this sort of standard dog training, you know, sit, sit and down and stay and all that sort of thing. But she's very good at that now, and a new lady's come with a brown dog. And as we were leaving, my son and I the other night, the lady with the brown dog came up to us and she said, I don't suppose our dog will ever be as good as your dog. <laughs> <laughs> so when we got outside, we went, yeah! Because <laughs> it was so amazing that anybody could say that about our yobbo of a dog. <laughs> And the touching thing is, the really charming thing is that she adores my husband. She loves him. She never heard what he said about her that night. <laughs> And, and when he comes in at night from work, he's tired, you know, he doesn't want to dance the salsa or anything. He's a tired man and he's got a green leather reclining armchair. He likes to sit in his chair, put his feet up. He's got his newspaper to the right, a cup of coffee to the left and the telly. And he's perfectly happy, you know, he sits down with a sigh of contentment. And this dog, she watches him. <laughs> she watches him till he's settled. <laughs> 
And then she goes over to him, and she's got a very sinuous, snake-like sort of movement. She goes pussyfooting over to him like this. And she lays down in a great arc underneath and round the side of his chair under the footrest, and she rolls over onto her back like this, and she puts these four great hooves <laughs> up into the air, and she looks back at him with this expression of absolute devotion. She just <laughs> adores him. But unfortunately, she is a martyr to flatulence. <laughs> And this can spoil the effect somewhat. <laughs> sometimes my husband doesn't have to turn the pages of the paper himself at all. <laughs> anyway, anyway, so far I'm very pleased to be able to tell you that I've still got two dogs and one husband under the same roof. <laughs> I, um, I was saying to you earlier that I get some really interesting invitations to travel. Um, and one, not long ago, uh, I was invited to go to Kenya, uh, to Malindi on the coast of, of Kenya. And a it's a village. And I was asked to go there to a very posh hotel. Um, people go there to fish for the big game fish, you know, like marlin and um, the big sail fish and tuna. And so it's a very smart um, place to go and it's got beautiful white sands. And this hotel, over the holiday, the Christmas holiday period, they take in a big number of guests and they close the doors and then they make a real fuss of them and they give them lovely food and they take them out fishing and they bring in all sorts of entertainers and speakers to entertain them. And I was asked to go in and do the speech on the um, New Year's Eve day. That was my little job. And we were all going, all of us could, um, could go, and it was eight days, just an eight day trip. So it was very exciting, but I didn't know what to pack because I'd never really been to Africa before. And I knew it was hot. <laughs> I knew that much. And I knew that where we were going was malarial, so you were supposed to cover your arms at night. And yeah, I was going to go out and talk to this um, audience, you know, in the open air on the, on the terrace. And I didn't have any evening wear that was cool or that covered your arms. And I, I, I got in a real lather anyway. I didn't know what to pack. And I fell into that trap where you think to yourself, well, I don't know whether to take that one or that one, <laughs> so I'll take them both. Um, <laughs> And consequently, I finished up packing this vast green suitcase, which weighed a ton. And my two poor sons staggered around the tropical steaming heat of Africa with it, saying, you, mother, are a right pillock. <laughs> and, I... <laughs> and I was. I mean, it was unforgivable, the amount of stuff I took. And when we arrived at this hotel, the proprietor came came out to greet us and he looked at my great big green suitcase and he said, he said, oh, I see you travel light. So, <laughs> so I got it in the neck from everybody and deservedly so because of course I brought the whole lot back home again and I hadn't worn a fraction of it. It was nonsense. And I was ashamed of myself really because I should have been better organised. And I was talking to my girlfriends but they seemed very flippant. They said, oh yeah, well, I always do that. I always take too much stuff, bring it all home again. Don't worry about it. See? So I thought, well, if we're all doing it, it might be worth me having a little think about writing a poem on the subject. So this is it, and um, it's called The Packing Poem, which is a very profound and well-considered <laughs> title. And it goes like this. I'm packing for me holidays. I want to take enough of cotton underclothing, swimming wear, sarongs and stuff. I take my own shampoo, conditioner and my own hair dryer. I don't trust those hotel ones not to set your hair on fire. <laughs> I take insect repellent, both the lotion and the spray. It makes you smell a creosote, but it keeps the bugs away. <laughs> you only get one skin, and I shall take good care of mine by packing all this sun protection, factor 99. <laughs> right, well, that's filled up one suitcase, and I am only taking two. <laughs> Now, for holiday in anywhere, you need a comfy shoe. 
So it's sandals for the sunny weather, walkers when it's cool, flatties for sightseeing and some flip-flops for the pool, higher heels for evenings, but these make me ankles ache, so I take some lower, strappy ones in case they're a mistake. <laughs> Does it sound familiar to anybody so far? <laughs> Oh, but my feet look neglected. I'm not proud of them, oh my. But it's been so cold, I haven't really seen them since July. <laughs> now, women with attractive feet will look at mine and scoff. So I take some nail polishes and some stuff to take it off. Clippers, moisturiser and a piece of pumice stone so I can rasp the soles <laughs> when I'm somewhere on my own. <laughs> Ah, well, that's filled up that suitcase. <laughs> so I'll have to take the three. But taking one half full seems very sensible to me, because when you've hit the local markets, you've got spaces, free and clear, to pop in every keepsake, knick-knack, gift and souvenir. So, now, moving on to clothing. I shall keep it cool and light, with something warm in case it turns out chilly on the flight. I'll need a coat for going to the airport there and back, and then again it could be raining, so I'll have to take a Mac. <laughs> but let's not think of rain. Let's think of sunshine, hot and strong. My poor old pasty body's been wrapped up for far too long. So in goes my wide-brimmed hat that set me back by 50 quid and me wrap-around sunglasses so I look like Jodie Kidd. <laughs> now, cotton dresses, sleeved and sleeveless, spotted, plain and checked. <laughs> well, I'll take a few of each. <laughs> and then at least I'll be correct. Trousers, light and dark with an elasticated band, so I can eat too much, sit back and let it all expand. <laughs> um, I'm taking lots of shorts, they're just a the thing for every day, though these look better from the front than when I walk away. <laughs> So I'll have to take the medium, the skimpy and the long, so whatever length I need, I'll have them all and I won't go wrong. Uh, now, my other small conundrum is, how dressy will it be? Eh? Because I don't want a situation where the odd one out is me, but if I pack something glamorous and pull out every stop, well, I could look like a Christmas tree and well over the top, see? So I'll have to take a compromise pack something in between. Now, this dress is black, unfussy, it's very classical and clean, and I'll take a filmy wrap to make it look a bit more swell, and this wrap's nice, and that one, I'll take those two as well. <laughs> ah, well, that's filled up that suitcase. Well, I'll have to take the four. It's getting rather difficult to move across the floor. But they're necessary items, all essential for the trip. I tell less travelled friends, don't overpack, you take my tip. <laughs> Finally, the travellers' checks, the tickets, cards and cash. Earplugs if the passenger next door talks balderdash. <laughs> my little bits of jewellery all done up in a roll. Ten blockbuster novels and me paracetamol. <laughs> You don't get rhymes like that in anybody else's poetry, do you? <laughs> now, just a few more incidentals. Glasses, cameras and clocks. Passport, medication and a pair of special socks to prevent deep vein thrombosis. <laughs> I've been wearing these all day. What amazing, blissful comfort. <laughs> They're just like a tourniquet. <laughs> well, that's it. I'm packed and ready. What a woman. What a star. My husband's coming up to take the cases to the car. <laughs> <laughs> He's bounding up the stairs. He's here. He's opening the door, taking one look at the luggage and passed out upon the floor. <laughs> Thank you.
Do you know what I miss when I'm away from home? My hairdresser. No, I do, because I've got a very nice hairdresser. I mean, I don't want much, as you can see, but, um, <laughs> but she's nice. And she, she, some people talk to you all the time, don't they? I don't mean this in a nasty way, but often you go to the hairdressers um, and you just want to sit quietly and just unwind. And the person who's doing your hair will keep talking to you. A fairly sort of vacant stuff, really. They'll, they'll say, do you come from round here? <laughs> Going out tonight? <laughs> Had your holidays? <laughs> And this, my hairdresser, she's very nice. She just lets me sit there quietly, and, and I like her, and I think she likes me. Well, anyway, when I go away, I don't know where to go, because I think some hairdressers can be very, very intimidating, can't they? These sort of cutting-edge ones. I went to one in Edinburgh once, and all the people in the hairdressers were dressed in black leather with facial piercings. <laughs> I was terrified. Anyway, earlier last year, I was in Australia, and I'd done various unwise things to my hair, and it looked a real mess. It looked horrible. And I didn't know where to go to get it sorted out, because I was doing television and everything, and I wanted to look nice, you know, as nice as I could anyway. And I said to this girl that I was working with, I said, I don't know what I'm going to do about my hair, because I've made a real mess of it, and I don't know where to go to get it sorted out, you know, so it looks all right again. And she said, oh, well, you've spoken to the right person. She said, you've spoken to the right person. I'll make an appointment for you at my hairdresser. He's marvellous. She said, he'll fit you in as it's you. She said, and he's not a hairdresser. He's a sculptor. <laughs> she said, when you walk in there, it is like spot the celeb. She said, you'll love it. It's marvellous. So I wasn't absolutely sure it sounded like my sort of place, but I, went, I didn't have anywhere else to go, so I thanked her very much and I accepted and I went along at the prescribed time where I was approached by the sculptor, who turned out to be a small man of Mediterranean appearance, <laughs> who, for reasons I did not understand, had intertwined into his own hair a tea towel. And he was very, very slim indeed, very slim. If my dad had seen him, my dad would have said, he looks like a matchstick with the wood shaved off. But anyway, <laughs> so I was sent over and had my hair washed, and then I was delivered back to the sculptor to have it blow dried. And he was waiting for the, with a big ball of mousse, you know that crackling mousse, they claw through your hair, and I don't like it myself. But anyway, I didn't seem to have much option. So this was all smarmed through my hair. And then he started to blow dry it. And at the end of the process, um, to my surprise, really, he asked me if I would put my head between my knees. <laughs> as if I'd fainted. You know, which I was shortly about to do, as a matter of fact. <laughs> so anyway, I put my head between my knees, as instructed, and he started doing these stupid fishy movements with his hands from the nape to the crown. He didn't say anything like this. He'd just go... <laughs> and eventually he stood back like this and spread his arms. I thought he was going to say voila, but he didn't. <laughs> and I've got my head down here like this. And I'm thinking... Well, he must have finished, you see. So... So I straighten up with great trepidation and I looked in the mirror and I, my heart sank. <laughs> I couldn't believe what he had done to my hair. You can imagine, if you have your head down like that with him pushing it all forward, it just stood up like a bin out in a hurricane. It was all... <laughs> it was all sticking out like this. I looked for all the world like a woman with her finger in the socket. <laughs> the, the, it was, It was all hard and stiff, and it looked ridiculous. And I looked in the mirror, and I, I, I knew straight away what I should have said. I should have said, see here, Ferdinand. <laughs> I, was like, I don't know what you think you're playing at, but this is not what I asked for. It's nothing like what I asked for. It looks perfectly awful. Uh, it, it's worse than when I came in, and I want it put right now at your expense. Yes. what I should have said. <laughs> of course, what I actually said was, 
Oh, it looks really nice. Thank you very much. And to, and to crown it all, this is the truth, I'm afraid. I went off and I left him a tip. Oh. I mean, why, why would I be like that, a grown woman? I wish I was a real strong woman, you know, and not such a wimp. I've got a friend, I've got a lovely American friend who's a real strong woman, and I'd like to be like her. She sees everything in black and white, you know, she, she can see what's wrong and what's right, whereas I shilly-shally, I, I think to myself, well, there's a case for that. And on the other hand, there's quite a good case for that. You know, like, I never make a decision. And my friend's a really clever woman, and she travels all over the world lecturing, and I just wish I was like her, because she can cope with anything. And once she was approached by a gigolo, you know. She was in this hotel, a nice hotel, and she'd gone into the bar in the evening on her own for a gin and tonic, and she was just sitting there, minding her own business. And this man came up to her, he came sidling up to her, and he said, hello. He said, you're very nice. She said, pardon? <laughs> He said, you're, you're a very attractive woman. I'm just um, rather sorry to see that you're here on your own. He said, and I wonder if you might be at all interested in a discreet service. <laughs> which I'm in a position to offer. <laughs> and she said, oh, oh really, what, um, what, what, what might it be? He said, well, I've got a vast experience of women, and I know that many women cherish fantasies and curiosities which, they, which their modesty forbids them to describe. <laughs> he said, and my discreet service is that for the sum of a hundred pounds, I would come home with you, and I would do anything you want, really. She said, I see. She said, uh, anything, anything. Oh, yes. She said, there's nothing to which I would not apply myself with vigor. <laughs> and she said, uh, you'll find, uh, should you wish to take advantage of my invitation, that I am very cooperative, broad-minded, and flexible. <laughs> she said, really? Flexible, yes, he said, oh yes, indeed, he said, I've got unsolicited testimonials. <laughs> he said, have you indeed? <laughs> oh yes, he said. She said, well, I do, I confess, feel very, very drawn to your offer, and I feel I would like to take you up on it, and I will give you a cheque for a hundred pounds, yes, I accept. And he said, oh, good, I'm extremely pleased to hear that. And could you give me any indication of what it is that you require in order that I can practice my technique? <laughs> he said, yes, I'd like you to come home with me and paint my house. <laughs> I'm the dolly on the dust cart. Hey. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm the dolly on the dust cart. I can see you're not impressed. I'm fixed below the driver's cab with wires across me chest. The dustman, see, he noticed me go in in the grinder and he fixed me on the lorry. I don't know if that was kinder. This used to be a lovely dress in pink and pretty shades but it's torn now being on the cart, and black as the ace of spades. There's dirt all round me face and all across me rosy cheeks. Well, I've had me head thrown back, but we ain't had no rain for weeks. <laughs> I used to be a mama doll. Tipped forward, I'd say, mum. But the rain's got in me squeaker, and now I've been struck dumb. <laughs> I had two lovely blue eyes, but out in the wind and weather, one sunk back in me head like. <laughs> and one's gone all together. Because <laughs> I'm not a soft, flesh-coloured dolly modern children like so much. I'm one of those hard, old dollies that are very cold to touch. Modern Dolly's underwear leaves me a bit nonplussed. I haven't got a bra, but then... <laughs> I haven't got a bust, but 
but I was happy in my doll's house. I was happy as a queen. Oh, I never knew that tiny tears was coming on the scene. <laughs> I heard of dolls with hair that grew, and I was quite enthralled until I realised my head was hard and pink and bald. <laughs> So I travel with the rubbish out of fashion, out of style, out of my environment for mile after mile. I am no longer prized. I'm dustbinized, <laughs> unfeminine, untidy. I'm the dolly on the dust cart, and there's no collection Friday. <laughs> Now, um, I, my husband and I have been married for 23 years, which is something of a surprise to me, to be honest, because I didn't go into it with that much conviction, if I'm honest. <laughs> I thought I'd give it a try for a fortnight, see how I get on. But, <laughs> but no, he's a, he's a very nice man. He's turned out very nicely under my careful guidance and tuition. <laughs> No, he's, he's a nice man, really. I feel very lucky. We all get on fine most of the time. But... <laughs> Whenever we have a real humdinger of a row, you know, a nasty one that you don't tell other people about, one of those where you shoot poisonous glances at each other and you don't talk and it all gets ugly. Uh, whenever we have a real row like that, it always grows up out of one particular situation, which we can't avoid, sadly, because it involves travel, and we travel all the time. And it's that situation where we're out in our car, and we're going somewhere we've never been before. <laughs> he is driving the car, and I have been given the task of reading the map. <laughs> Now, when I was single, I was perfectly adequate at reading the map. I, it, I didn't attach any particular significance to it. It was just something you did. You just got on with it. You know, I made a list of the various destinations and road numbers, and I stuck it up in front of me, and I sort of mentally ticked them off as I went along. There was no rocket science to it. I could do it perfectly well. <laughs> but years of abuse... <laughs> and unfounded criticism <laughs> and being told I got the brain of a limpet <laughs> has sadly done two things. It has eroded all my confidence. My confidence has gone for a burden. I haven't got any confidence anymore. And because, I, and because if somebody keeps on at you and keeps saying, well, you're useless, you are. You are absolutely hopeless. What a duffer. I mean, if somebody keeps saying that to you all the time, you, you start thinking, well, perhaps I am then. All right, perhaps I am. So I have lost confidence, and with it, really, I've lost the ability to do it. I can't do it anymore. I, I've, I've lost it. I could do it, but I've lost it. Yeah, thank you very much. And it's not my fault. It's his fault. <laughs> it's... His fault, without a doubt, because he's like many men, and men are very, very fortunate because they seem to have a sort of inbuilt sense of direction. And he's got it, without a doubt. He can, somehow, he can sense which way we're supposed to go, and I haven't got that. And he never shares it with me. I mean, he'll never... <laughs> He'll never be generous. He'll never be generous and say, oh, there's a difficult junction coming up ahead. You might like to look at the map and brace yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Now, you never get anything like that. The first time I realise anything has gone wrong on our journey is when I look up from whatever it was I should not have been looking at, probably a crossword or the paper, shouldn't have been looking at it, and I realise that we're going round and round the inside lane of some terrifying great motorway roundabout. <laughs> so that's the first thing I observe, and the second thing I realise is that my husband is muttering something unintelligible. <laughs> So I don't yet realise how bad it is. I don't realise how serious it is. So I just say to him in a chipper sort of way, I say, what did you say? I didn't hear what you said. What did you say? And then I look at him and I realise that the reason I can't understand what he's saying to me is because he's actually talking to me through his teeth. <laughs> right. And what he's actually saying is this. He's saying, which way is it? <laughs> You've got the map. Which way is it? Yeah, uh, uh, I look at him, 
And I get the shock of my life because I had no idea he'd got himself in such a stew. And he's gone a repulsive beetroot red. And you can actually feel the heat coming off him. It's like sitting next to a furnace. And if you look closely, you can see the veins pulsating in his neck like this. And it's as if he's got a coconut in his hand. He's saying, which way is it? Which way is it? You've got the map. Oh, you know, I, I, I mean, I defy anybody to think straight in that threatening, <laughs> in that threatening enclosed environment with one bully in the other. And I, I, I do my best. I look at the map. I can see all the writing on it. But somehow nothing is coming in. <laughs> um, and we're always on a bit that's right down in a join, you know. So. Yeah, and he's shouting, which way, which way is it? I'm afraid I just, I don't respond to being bullied like that. I just, I just say anything. I say that way over there, look. So try that. <laughs> so anyway, he, he takes me at my word. We go round the roundabout. We go off down this road that I've pointed out. And within a nanosecond, <laughs> we've both realised two things. One, it is the wrong road, of course. And two, it is the longest road on the face of the earth that has nowhere to turn round. And now, a terrible but interesting, a terrible but interesting change has come over my husband. And all the heat has dissipated away and it's been replaced by a kind of icy, <laughs> rigid fury. And he's gone as stiff, as stiff as a board. And his mouth has gone into this hideous little button. <laughs> and his eyes have gone like gimlets. And, and you can just see his front teeth working. It, so he's, he's, <laughs> so down the road we go, we happy couple. And eventually, mercifully, we see a gateway or a lay-by somewhere where we can turn around. So I can tell you precisely what's going to happen now because I've seen it a good few times. <laughs> Here, indicate left, but go over the road, you switch off the ignition, put on the handbrake. And next, you're taking a tremendous, totally unnecessary, exaggerated, theatrical sigh. <laughs> and when he exhales, he will shake his head from side to side and assume a strange frog-like smile <laughs> in which there is no humour whatsoever. And I will give you a demonstration of it. You'll recognise it when you see it. <laughs> so you remember we're driving along, he's stiff, his mouth's gone a horrible little button. You see the lay-by, over we go. He switches off the ignition, puts on the handbrake. Here comes the big sigh now, here it comes, he goes. And this hand appears under my nostrils. <laughs> and it's doing little contemptuous flicking movements like this. <laughs> For the map. He wants the map. <laughs> and he's still talking to me through his teeth. And he says, oh, give it to me. <laughs> and I'm still fighting. I'm still fighting back. I flap the map at him and I say, I don't know why we're on this road anyway. I don't know why you told us to take this road anyway. It's a terrible road. It's all over the place. It's all full of junctions and twists and turns. There's another perfectly good road here. Look, a road that goes straight there. I don't know why we're not on that. 
he snatches the map and he says, because it's a bloody railway. <laughs> So that's it, I'm beaten. <laughs> I'm defeated once again. I hand over the map. I feel like a little schoolgirl has got it wrong yet again. <laughs> and after one of these joyful journeys, I wrote my husband a short tribute, <laughs> which I would like to recite a small fragment of now. I am going to kill my husband. <laughs> no, I have stuck all I can stick. His constant criticising is getting on my wick. Oh, he takes it all for granted. But tonight, I can relax. For the minute he complains, I shall whop him with the axe. <laughs> yes, I'm going to kill my husband. You may not think I've got the right, but he snores as well. <laughs> and I should know I'm with him every night. With this irritating, steady rhythm, whistle, snore, and snort. Well, tonight he's gonna stay asleep <laughs> for longer than he thought. This is a poem I wrote because I'm of an age when a lot of my friend's husbands are retiring now. And I observe that for some of the couples, this is a tremendous and exciting success. <laughs> <laughs> but for others, it, it takes a bit more getting used to, uh, particularly if he is a man of firm opinions. Uh, so it's partly about that, but it's mostly just about the person we all know who knows it all. And it doesn't matter what your little modest opinion might be, he is going to overwhelm it with his enormously important opinion. And I'd just like to make it perfectly clear, of course, that it's nothing to do with any member of my own family. <laughs> no. You believe me, don't you? Yes, that's all right then. Anyway, this is it. You know, this world is complicated and imperfect and oppressed. And it's not hard to feel timid, apprehensive and depressed. It seems that all around us, tides of questions ebb and flow. And people want solutions, but they don't know where to go. Opinions abound, but who is wrong and who is right? No, people need a prophet, a diffuser of the light, someone they can turn to as the crises rage and swirl, someone with the remedy, the wisdom, the pearl. Well, they should have asked my husband. <laughs> yeah. No, he'd have told him. <laughs> then and there, his thoughts on immigration, teenage mothers, Tony Blair, <laughs> the future of the monarchy, house prices in the south, the wait for hip replacements, BSE and foot and mouth. <laughs> now, they should have asked my husband. He can sort out any mess. He can rejuvenate the railways. He can cure the NHS. So any little niggle, anything you want to know, just run it past my husband, wind him up and let him go. <laughs> See? Congestion on the motorways, free holidays for thugs, the damage to the ozone layer, refugees, drugs. These may defeat the brain of any politician bloke, but present it to my husband. He will solve it at a stroke. He'll clarify the situation. He will make it crystal clear. You'll feel the glazing of your eyeballs <laughs> and the bending of your ear. <laughs> Corruption at the top is an authority on that and the Mafia, Gaddafi and Yasser Arafat. <laughs> Upon these areas, he brings his intellect to shine. 
in a great compelling voice that's twice as loud as yours or mine. <laughs> I often wonder what it must be like to be so strong, infallible, articulate, self-confident and wrong. <laughs> When it comes to tolerance, he hasn't got a lot. Joyriders should be guillotined and muggers should be shot. The sound of his own voice becomes like music to his ears and he hasn't got an inkling that he's boring us to tears. Oh, it's relentless. It's unstoppable. The hunting ban was grim. I fantasise at night about the hounds pursuing him. <laughs> one thing and one thing only caused a smile his face to crack. At last, we beat Australia. <laughs> and we got the ashes back. My friends don't call so often. They have busy lives, I know, but it's not every day you want to hear a windbag suck and blow. <laughs> Encyclopedias, on them we never have to call. Why clutter up the bookshelf when my husband knows it all? <laughs> <laughs>